Hello, and welcome to this conversation with Asma Yudin on her new book, The Politics of Vulnerability, How to Heal Muslim-Christian Relations in a Post-Christian America. Uh, my name is Judd Bertzall, and I serve as a senior research fellow at the, at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. And today's event is being um, hosted in partnership with our colleagues at the Al-Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown. In terms of format, we'll, I will begin by asking a series of questions uh, to Asma to draw out some of the key themes and arguments and, and recommendations uh, in her book. And then we'll use the latter half of our hour together for audience Q&A. You can type your question uh, at any time. Uh, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and a window will pop open where you can uh, type your question. Uh, do be as brief as you can be in phrasing your question so that we can get through as many of the questions as possible uh, during our time uh, together. Also feel free to list your uh, institutional affiliation uh, as part of your, your question. Uh, this event is being uh, recorded and a recording will be posted to our website soon and you'll receive an email uh, when the video is up. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, our author today. Uh, Asma Yudin is a religious liberty uh, lawyer and scholar working to promote religious liberty for people of all faiths and backgrounds, both in the US and around the world. Uh, she previously served as counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. Her previous book was uh, When Islam is Not a Religion, Inside America's Fight for Religious Freedom. Uh, she's a fellow at the Aspen Institute's Inclusive America Project, and she's the founding editor of altmuslima.com. And she's also an expert advisor on religious freedom to the OSCE. Asma, uh, thank you so much for joining me uh, in, in conversation today. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading this book. I, I found it was just full of, of interesting analysis and, and really helpful uh, recommendations. Uh, and that it really em embodied the sort of empathy that you say is needed to depolarize and detribalize American life and, and to improve uh, relations between uh, Muslim communities and, and white evangelicals uh, in, in particular. And as one of those white evangelicals uh, myself, I just was deeply appreciative of the sympathetic uh, yet not uncritical way that you treated uh, my own, own community in the book and all the reasons our, my community has gone haywire in the, in the past couple of years. So thank you for, for all of that. Um, and congratulations on the, the publication of the book. <clears throat> I thought I'd uh, like to start with just a, a broad introductory uh, question for you to get our conversation going. Uh, and that is, uh, what is the politics of vulnerability and, and what inspired you to write this book at this time? Well, thank you, Judd, uh, for doing this event with me, and thank you to the Berkeley Center for organizing it and for everyone who's attending. Uh, and I'm really glad that the book reflects the empathy that, um, that I was hoping it reflects. I mean, sometimes you're set out to be empathetic, but you don't really know if you're doing it the right way. And, and I was I had a lot of sort of attention and, and care, but also anxiety about whether or not I was modeling that the right way. Um, because you know, for the first half of the book, it's really about taking the reader and putting them in the shoes of of conservative white evangelicals and conservative Christians more broadly in this country. And so it's really about just how do you explain to others what, what someone else is feeling, someone other than yourself, right? And, and how can you be true to that? And so, I mean, this very much ties into the question of like why I even wrote this book and what inspired it. And you mentioned earlier that my first book, um, which came out in 2019, uh, was titled When Islam is Not a Religion, Inside America's Fight for Religious Freedom. And I wrote that book after kind of being in this religious freedom space, both litigating and also, you know, public advocacy, public speaking, education, religious engagement for about a decade. And, you know, noticing a lot of trends, but one trend that I was really troubled by that got, that inspired the first book was this phenomenon of a group of people being very, very committed to defending religious freedom for themselves and the idea, this idea, the sort of like abstract idea of religious freedom, but then also unfortunately being either supportive or at, at, at minimum um, not really worried about this claim that I was hearing increasingly that Muslims do not get religious freedom in the United States. 
uh, and, the, and usually tied around this idea that Islam is not a religion, which is a claim that has actually been argued explicitly in court cases. Um, and that therefore, you know, if Islam is not a religion, then Muslims don't get religious freedom. That's kind of how the, the logic of that claim works. And so my first book, I, I spent a good part of it delving into a lot of the details around that, kind of like who's saying it, why are they saying it, how is this impacting Muslims' rights in very concrete ways and leading to a lot of, of very real problems, um, even beyond the legal space to actual, you know, sharp rise in hate crimes to not just challenges to mosques um, in their quest to be built, but also once they're built, they, you know, a number of mosques being burned down in part or in whole. Um, and even challenges among, you know, some conservative Christians, unfortunately, it tends to be Christians, um, to even the building of Muslim cemeteries, uh, which to me is sort of like the height of dehumanization, uh, when you can't even understand sort of the shared human experience of birth and death. And so I wrote this book. Um, the second half of the book is, of the first one, is really kind of looking at the culture war, a phenomenon that has emerged quite uh, quite prominently in the religious freedom space. And in that part, I, I tell the reader that I, this book is about Muslims' rights, but I need you to know that I actually advocate for religious freedom for all groups across the spectrum, including the group that tends to uh, be sort of pitted against Muslims um, in, the, in the public discourse, um, and that those are conservative Christians, and that I have actually advocated for their rights. And advocating for them, I understand them to be sincere religious believers, um, who bring their claims out of a strong need to kind of carve their space out in American society. And so it was interesting to me to kind of go on tour with this book. Um, I, you know, I didn't expect what, what happened, which was um, one, just a wonderful book tour, being invited to all kinds of venues uh, across the nation, but also just politically speaking, considering especially how we tend to kind of box things into particular categories, uh, on the one hand, kind of expected a lot of more, you know, left of center um, or, you know, or very liberal audiences to be open to my message, uh, but also found myself speaking to a number of very, very conservative audiences. And one of those events is actually one that I opened the new book with. And time and again, kind of finding myself surprised in many ways at the ways that, that my, to be frank, like just very open and blunt, you know, criticism, of some of the things that were coming out of this conservative camp were being kind of given a platform, uh, were being sort of uh, something that people wanted to hear and also wanted to be in dialogue with. And so it got me thinking, you know, what's going on here? Like, you know, why, why is it that I can have these sorts of conversations, um, but I, these are conversations that I don't think are quite common at all. In fact, I wasn't really clear if there was anyone, who, any other American Muslim who does speak so, you know, openly about the injustices that, that the Muslim community is facing, who is then brought into these spaces to talk about that. And so I set out to kind of um, mine, you know, like my, my sort of anecdotal evidence of the sort of observations and experiences. And I really wanted to articulate for, for a broader audience, it's like, you know, what was going on here? And how is this something that we can, that I can potentially sort of um, you know, amplify and disseminate and kind of perhaps, you know, begin a conversation on, on an alternative approach that helps people uh, sort of depolarize our conversations and, and resist this, this need to kind of put ourselves in like different buckets, different tribes. And so in, in the course of researching and writing the book, I end up, you know, you put like just pulling elements from all kinds of different fields, from fields of social psychology, from political science, um, from jurisprudence, kind of like what is the law from cultures or a political analysis um, and sort of piecing it together for the reader to explain to them what I what I think was going on in these exchanges and what is what's now you know after doing the research and kind of this new sort of emerging area in the area of religious freedom where political scientists are actually trying to figure this out too like whether what is a way that we can get people talking who otherwise wouldn't be talking and how can we use religious freedom to get them talking and so it was kind of exciting for me to kind of be doing this, you know, parallel to this sort of studies and these findings emerging. Um, so that's what the book is about. It's kind of, um, it's called The Politics of Vulnerability because, you know, first and foremost, I, I understand the vulnerability as a real vulnerability um, on the part of many conservative Christians. And I you know, sort of approach them with that understanding that this is something that's real to you and that's not 
something that's fake. It's not a pretext. You're not just saying you feel this way or that somehow feeling this way is, is unnatural or, or inherently bigoted. Uh, but this is just a really human thing that you're experiencing. And, and I understand that, but I also, I'm really concerned about the way that that vulnerability gets politicized and weaponized. Um, and so that's what the book is about, really kind of figuring out what is that vulnerability, but then also figuring out how it gets weaponized and how we might stop it from becoming weaponized. Oh, thank you, Asma, for getting our, our conversation going. Um, you know, one, one of the strengths of the book I found was the, the way in which you weave your own experience into the analysis. And I think it helps to, to illustrate and animate the, the arguments uh, that you're making. Um, in your answer just now, you talked about tribes and, and, and boxes and so on. Um, I wonder if you could help us better understand how we've got here in terms of uh, Muslims in America and evangelicals in America, despite so many theological and moral and other similarities, have ended up very much in different tribes or, or mega identities, as you call them uh, in the book. Uh, how did we get here where um, these two communities are so polarized? Yeah, I mean, so the, this concept of mega identities was for me just an amazing thing to sort of stumble upon because I, I certainly um, identify this phenomenon, right? Like in just sort of thinking through this and kind of just sort of reflecting on my experiences. Um, and the mega identity idea, which is um, proposed by Liliana Mason in her book on civil agreement and her, and, Lili and Mason is, is a political scientist. And what she identified was this phenomenon where our political identities are not just about policy issues anymore, but have now extent, extended to include all kinds of things, including um, even where we do our grocery, uh, what cars we drive, what we eat, uh, which restaurants we like, which cities we live in, and this she calls mega identities. And, and all of these things are now becoming polarized, right? So that you can actually group Republicans according to, again, with the grocery store, the restaurants, the foods, the cities, the cars, right? And, the, and all of these things are becoming politicized. It's almost like you're kind of like selling out your group if you choose to buy the car that it's, it, the other side drives. Um, and, you know, I haven't thinking about this because I had noticed, um, I think it was really on full display during the Trump era, um, the way that Muslims had become what I, what I call in the book, a trait of the liberal mega identity. Um, and, and by the way, in, in writing this book and sort of like focusing on, on this piece of the puzzle of what drives anti-Muslim sentiment on the part of some conservatives and Christians in particular, I'm not saying this is like the entire picture. I, I, acknowledge up front that it's a complicated analysis and that there are so many different pieces of it. We certainly can't you know, discount the elements of race and racism, racialization of Muslims, uh, or the, the question of security and sort of the way that 9-11 has sort of uh, uh, impacted the, the overall impression of Muslims, that Muslims are seen as both internal and external security threats. But those are the pieces of the puzzle that I think get a lot of attention. Um, and the political piece, I didn't think anyone was really kind of you know, it really kind of zeroing in on, in on, which to me seemed a bit odd because in a time of such, you know, deep politicization, you know, political calls it the ferocious politicization of everything, which I think is another way of describing this concept of mega identities, that everything, you know, Whole Foods shopping, Americans being sort of lumped into the Democratic Party, you know, that, that shows you that everything is politicized. So I'm like, why isn't this very, you know, public and prominent sort of battle between Christians and Muslims uh, that I was seeing play out, at this, you know, in terms of the commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases, um, the travel ban, and you know, and a whole host of other things that you know that former President Trump was proposing was actually being supported by white evangelicals. I was like, clearly, there's something going on here in terms of Muslims becoming a proxy for for the left. Um, and so that's what I explore, you know, sort of like as a bigger frame here that it's the sort of the, that that proxy making, right? The tokenization of Muslims in this way. And then the, and the, to couple that with the tribal politics and the way that we're opposed to the full range of traits of the opposing mega identity, so that it almost becomes necessary part of being a loyal member of the Republican party or being a loyal member of the conservative Christian you know, group that you have to oppose Muslims because Muslims and championing of Muslims rights is a liberal or democratic thing to do. Um, and therefore you don't do it. You can't be a sellout to your own group. Um, and so that's something that that I, I present in the book up front, and then it kind of you know serves as an umbrella or a frame for the rest of my uh, my discussion.
Thanks. And, and one of the things that plays into uh, this uh, polarization, these mega identities, is the contestation between who is more discriminated, who is more vulnerable, or at the international level, who is more persecuted. Uh, in the book, you, you reference uh, those surveys that ask Americans which community faces the most discrimination. Uh, and at the international level, you can find commentary on whether it's Muslims or Christians who face the most uh, persecution. And of course, there's, there's implications to, to whatever the answer may be. If, if one group is more persecuted, then they deserve more uh, resources and policy attention uh, and, and so on. Um, what, what, what's your take on this, this contestation or the perceptions of who is, is persecuted or discriminated against more? Is, that a, is it helpful to make those sort of comparisons? No, it's not helpful at all. <laughs> and you know, you're in the in the book, as you know, I kind of go through these different um, these different surveys that ask this question: Who do you think is more discriminated against, Muslims or Christians? Right. So just even the thinking through and the sort of this realization that I was having about um, these these two religious groups serving as proxies for political tribes. You know, I would see these polls over the years, just be like you know, what's going on? Why is it like Muslims versus Christians or specifically, or even what, you know, Muslims versus white evangelicals versus like any other group? Like, I don't really see that being asked about Jews or Hindus or Buddhists or, or others. Um, so, you know, what was further evidence that, that some, something was going on here that was deeply political? And, and no, it doesn't help because that it creates this dynamic of, of competing victimhood is what I call it in the book. Um, internationally, I know that a number of advocates have referred to it as the victim Olympics, um, not which is applicable not just to the Muslim Christian divide, but um, I think between any other you know set of powerful major majority versus marginalized minority, right? That that's the the dichotomy that's set up, and then it's just sort of a fight about like which of us is the bigger victim, and we get so caught up in just trying to figure out which of us is a bigger victim, which necessarily means we we have to diminish the importance or the or the experiences of what the other side is going through in order to shore up um, our own claim of being the most discriminated against. And so while I purchase this in the book, I, I am clear about the fact that, you know, I'm not saying these two groups are going through the same thing or the same levels of, of oppression and marginalization. Um, I absolutely, you know, recognize that, of course, being a member of the American Muslim community and seeing what other members of my community are experiencing, I can't say that the urgency of that and the level of sort of physical violence that my community faces is in any way sort of paralleled, um, you know, by what Christians are going through. Um, but it's sort of being able to step out of that and say, yeah, I'm not saying that it's the same, but I'm also not saying that I have to diminish everything you're going through in order to make my own claim, uh, which unfortunately I think those sorts of comparisons sort of set people up to do that. Um, and I think, you know, naturally it's going to be a skewed perception because we live in our own informational environments, which are increasingly in starkly opposition or distinct from each other in a polarized context. But of course, but again, it's your, our own experiences, it's our own figures of authority who are telling us, just, you know, and reinforcing often kind of like what are our stories of victimization, um, our stories of suffering. And so, you know, it's, I saw this happening with respect to Christians where I saw, um, you know, if, you know, all the way from like sort of religious leaders to political leaders to presidential candidates, um, emphasizing over and over again that religious freedom is under threat and specifically religious freedom for Christians, that, that traditional Christianity is under threat, that um, traditional way of American way of life, uh, the secularism, these sort of Democrats represent the dark forces of secularism. I mean, this is a message that's reinforced over and over again. So if that's your informational environment, those are the news pieces that you're reading. That's the echo chamber that you exist in. Of course, you're going to think, you know, and meanwhile, you don't really hear anything about what the other group is going through, um, or you're told what that group is going through either is not real or uh, they probably deserve it. Um, then you are going to come to the conclusion that you are the more discriminated against. Um, and so in the book, I actually tie this into the way specifically religious freedom is sort of interwoven, that the narrative of religious freedom, because suddenly you're told that you're under threat, your religious community is under threat. And the way to protect you is uh, to protect yourself is to use religious freedom as sort of a shield for your own interest. Then that sort of converts uh, or transforms religious freedom into a partisan tool. Uh, and there's two piece pieces of that. It's both a shield to protect your own interest, but also a sword to sort of minimize um, the rights of others.
very good point. On, on the, the question of um, uh, hostility towards Muslims or discrimination against Muslims, you know in the book that you generally try to avoid using the term Islamophobia, which is often a sort of shorthand way of getting at all of this. Uh, wh why do you tend to avoid that term? First and foremost, because I am trying to communicate in a way that actually gets my message across. Um, and so I don't want to use words and, and frames that will immediately make the other side sort of resistant. Um, and I mean, this was something that, you know, I, I was sort of debating on a number of different fronts, even uh, sort of the subtitle to the book says how to heal Muslim Christian relations in a post-Christian Amer uh, post -Christian America. And I remember there being lots of debate about whether or not it was a good idea for me to put post-Christian America there. Um, ultimately decided that, you know, I, th I think it was, it was important. Um, but, you know, like, it was just like, how do I get people to understand not just what I'm saying? I mean, that's a piece of why I left post-Christian America on the, on the title, because I have to be true also to what I'm, what I'm trying to communicate. Um, but also if, if, you know, making sure that the message is actually communicated. And so with respect to Islamophobia, again, it was lots of, you know, observation and also just sort of feedback by experts in the field that um, Islamophobia just doesn't sort of land the way you want it to land. It doesn't really make people, uh, particularly on the political right, you know, think, um, you know, in empathetic terms, you know, we, we started this conversation about empathy. It doesn't, it doesn't pierce through that competing victimhood. Um, you can have a million headlines about the rise of Islamophobia, but it's still going to make, for example, people think that they themselves are more persecuted against or that Islamophobia is something not real. And in fact, uh, a writer in the National Review referred to Islamophobia as Islamopho, F-A-U-X-Bia, right? So kind of like, oh yeah, right, like that thing is sort of like mostly made up and, you know, or to the extent it's real, it's not as serious um, as the left is always making it out to be. Um, you know, lots of commentators and critics on the right to kind of talk about Islamophobia as essentially being, um, you know, just another reflection of liberal political correctness that tries to uh, take attention away from the real problem, which in their minds is Muslim extremism. And you can't have a critical conversation about Islamic extremism. They call it, you know, if, if you keep saying Islamophobia and that you're basically sort of an infantilizing Muslims. Um, and so kind of seeing that a lot, um, but also specifically because this book was about evangelicals and also kind of hearing from people in the community that they think of Islamophobia and any number of these other terms with phobia attached to it, that any sort of disagreement um, is, is sort of like a shaming tactic that it's like, we can't, again, for you to express X, Y, Z position is by itself sort of inherently something um, that's bigoted. And so, you know, we can't have the conversation and you're gonna make me feel bad about it. You're going to sort of make me feel shameful about it. Um, and that they sort of shut down in response to the term Islamophobia. Um, and again, you know, and another thing I talk about is the way that the term has now further sort of exacerbated the dynamics of, of victimhood, of competing victimhood, so that there's a, a rise in this use of a term called Christophobia. And so like, if this is the way we're gonna talk about this, and this is something I talk about even in, in context of, for example, the way, um, claims are presented now legally in terms of, you know, each group as a, as, as a despised group, the rise of sort of civil rights claims and the sort of group identity dynamics that happen there. Similarly, it's like, well, if we can't really fight it, then we're just gonna do the same thing. And we're gonna come up with a term and say, now we are this identity group um, that also has a phobia against it. Um, and so, you know, for all those reasons, I mean, of course I do use a term in terms of, you know, quoting other people who use it or if there, or if there is different, reports that have the, the the word in the title, I'll bring it up in that way. Um, but I do try to otherwise avoid it. Um, and also focus on specifically for anti-Muslim sentiment that this is about people, not about religions per se, but about what people are going through. I wanted to ask you a question about another contested term, and that is the very term religious freedom, which is increasingly fraught. And you, you talked about it as, um, uh, potentially uh, uh, a shield and a, and a, and a weapon uh, in our tribal uh, warfare in, in the states. Uh, in the book, you urge um, progressives and others on, on the, the cultural and political left uh, to not just interpret evangelical or conservative use of the term religious freedom as a cover for um, some form of, of, of bigotry. 
uh, wh why, why do you hold out uh, the, the possibility of the positive, uh, capacious use of religious freedom? Sure, I mean, I think because I just don't believe that it is a pretext for bigotry. I don't think that this is all just sort of, um, you know, a project of in hate, right? I actually think that the religious freedom claims represent genuine religious beliefs. Now, I think on this point, I think it's important, you know, to sort of focus on the distinctions that I make in the book. Um, and the first part, you know, part one is titled, which Christians, right? So I'm talking about Muslim Christian relations and I'm trying to sort of present a case uh, on how I think that there's some sort of bridge building um, can, be, can be sort of possible in between conservative Christians and, and Muslims, American Muslims um, in the United States. And, but what I was also noticing in, in my, in, on my book tour and the public discourse more broadly is that conservative Christians or conservative white evangelicals specifically were often conflated, conflated with Christian nationalists. And so my part one, you know, which Christians, then the chapter there is titled uh, Christian nationalists do not equal conservative white evangelicals. Um, those two are, are very distinct groups. And I think that's important to understand for, for, for the audience now that, but there's certain types of people who can maybe be saying the same thing and be using the same language of religious freedom, but have very different uh, intentions behind it, different goals with it. Um, and I distinguish that in the book that Christian nationalists are sort of this group, and this is not a group of people that I am proposing will be amenable to my approach or, or, or people that I can really, um, you know, bridge build with, but there's this other group of people that tend to be conflated with them, often because they're using the same terms, uh, and often because, it's, you know, politically expedient to sort of conflate these two groups. Um, and, you know, but I have very personal and, and extensive experience with this other group of people that I definitely don't think are Christian nationalists and who are so open um, to, you know, thinking creatively uh, about Muslim Christian re relations um, and who sort of, um, you know, em sort of embody the same empathy that I try to embody in my own work. And so with respect to the second group, um, absolutely, it's, you know, I see it, I see that it's sincere religious beliefs. Like I, I really kind of like being in that space and understanding the deep sort of religiosity um, and sincerity of faith there, you know, was made it clear to me from the very beginning throughout my work that this language about religious freedom sort of serving as mere cover for bigotry just doesn't have it right. Yes, do some people use it as a cover for bigotry? Absolutely. Um, but do, does everyone who brings those same type of claims uh, use it that way? Uh, not at all. And so, it's again, that sort of element of my experience that I was trying to kind of bring through in this book. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think those dis distinctions are the clear, the, the careful ones to have here. And ultimately the book is driving toward this idea that like if we can engage with people as people and stop trying to conflate them with people that we think are hateful, um, then what ultimately the goal here is that to sort of minimize the hostility and for the politicization of that vulnerability, right? They have vulnerability, which is natural and human, uh, but when you keep treating that human that that vulnerability with so much contempt, you sort of lead or contribute to that politicization and weaponization of that vulnerability. But what if we just don't do that? What if we just see those people for who they are and what they're experiencing, and try to prevent these dynamics of, for example, setting up competing victimhoods or leading to a place where these people could actually end up supporting, not just dismissing, but also supporting. The deprivation of rights of religious minorities, because now their vulnerability has been weaponized in this way. Thanks, Asma. Let me uh, remind our audience: uh, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by clicking the Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and type your question as briefly as you can in the window that uh, that pops up. And you're welcome to include your institutional affiliation in your question as well, so we know who you are and where you're coming from. And I see a few questions are already in there. So thanks for those questioners who have um, posed their questions already. Um, Asma, in the interest of time, I want, I want to get to um, some of the recommendations you have uh, in the book for how to build greater empathy, for how to depolarize and detribalize our politics, how to improve relations between Muslims and evangelicals uh, in, in particular. And there, there are several terms that you use uh, either uh, later on in the book or in a couple of cases throughout the book that I'd love for you to uh, unpack a bit for our audience and perhaps give some practical examples of what that uh, could look like. Uh, and the first one that you use throughout the book is uh, zooming in. Uh, 
And, and by that, you don't mean logging on to Zoom calls uh, like this one, though maybe, maybe it could involve uh, actual use of the, the Zoom software, but um, what, is, what is Zooming in? Why is it so important and what, what can it look like? Sure. So in the course of writing this book, I mean, I mentioned earlier that I, I bring in elements from so many different areas, uh, culture, jurisprudence, social psychology, et cetera. And I remember being on my book tour sort of like on the way to what I knew was going to be like this really sort of heated conversation, really kind of uh, complicated spaces, right, where I was talking about religious freedom in a way that was consistent for both sides, uh, the right and the left for minorities and for Christians, uh, conservative Christians. And, you know, and how do you navigate some of those spaces, right? And so while I was, you know, feeling some level of, um, I mean, I guess some, some level of like trepidation around, you know, kind of heading into some of these spaces. Um, you know, I was reading a book by Brene Brown, who's sort of like the expert on vulnerability. Um, and she has this book called Braving the Wilderness. And I found what she was saying about vulnerability and the need to sort of like lean into our vulnerability instead of sort of using the vulnerability against others uh, to be really helpful in the way that I was thinking about what I was doing in these exchanges. And so she's, and the, the phrase zooming in was some, is a, the phrase that I kind of pulled out of her book. Um, and she's like, you know, in our times like this, where it's so much about this process of, you know, trying to come into our own group or our own tribe and position ourselves against others, a lot of that is driven and exacerbated by this phenomenon where we sort of just look at what the news media is saying and what you know different articles and commentary in our and our echo chamber says echo chamber says about the other group. Now what we're doing is we're sort of taking that as the truth about what those people are, as opposed to like she says, zooming in and kind of figuring out who those people are as people, like who are you actually, as opposed to what is it that's said about you. And I think this is like a huge part of the problem in religious freedom arena today. I mean, there's a huge reason why things are as bad as they are and, and are getting increasingly politicized such that this, this fundamental human rights um, is now a partisan tool um, is because we sort of, sort of take, or, you know, we just sort of take as an accepted fact that what we hear about these other people, whether it be conservatives looking at liberals as sort of these, again, sort of, you know, the, in terms of the dark forces of secularism as people who don't like religion, who are trying to sort of destroy all that is traditional and religious about America, right? That's, that's one part of it. And then on the other side, um, this idea that if people are bringing claims that we just don't understand with respect to, for example, sexual freedom, um, that they are inherently sort of anti-women, anti-sexual minorities, um, they're bigoted, they're hateful, and, and nobody really kind of takes a moment to step out of their, their sort of informational echo chamber and say, who are these people actually? Um, and so in the book, I, I try to demonstrate that as well and say, look, there's all these really interesting elements here, so many facts and details that you probably don't know that I know because I'm in the space, I'm sort of thinking about this all the time, that I feel that if we're gonna have this conversation about vulnerability, I need to translate over to you, the reader, um, and say, look, if you zoomed in, this is what you would find out about all these people that you would otherwise assume to be pretty hateful. Um, and so I, I think zooming in, and, I, and it goes, you know, in the, this Muslim Christian divide, it, it absolutely goes from the other direction as well. I think Muslims are, have, have been um, for a long time and are still kind of thought of a, as a monolith. Uh, we're all the same. We tend to be, you know, painted in terms of what the latest or sensational headline will tell you about us. And no matter how much work, good work is being done, among some circles to complicate that picture. I think a lot of conservatives remain pretty resistant to seeing that more nuanced picture. Uh, they, they, they're very resistant to sort of zooming in and understanding Muslims for, for who each person is, um, not as a, as a, uh, a monolith. And so, um, you know, I see that problem, but in calling out the problem, I'm not gonna then say, it's okay for me to treat another group as a monolith. I don't want you to treat my religious community as a monolith. So I'm not gonna do that to your group as well. Two other uh, recommendations or terms that I'd like for you to, to unpack for us if you're happy to. Um, one is uh, superordinate goals. What, what are superordinate goals and why are they helpful in this uh, context? And then the other one that jumped out to me was your discussion of tolerance, which often gets derided today as something very flimsy or tepid or just a very, very low bar, but you present it as, as an important first step in all of this. So your thoughts on superordinate goals and, and tolerance. 
Sure. So subordinate goals and tolerance are both strategies or um, social psychological strategies to help heal intergroup divides. Um, and yeah, I was a little bit sort of, you know, I understood that tolerance tends to kind of be dismissed um, as something that just sort of like, you know, kind of like an idealistic way of thinking. But I presented specifically in terms of these sort of empirical studies. Um, and tolerance being sort of the distinction between kind of looking at another group of people as a group of people, as opposed to looking at them for the specific beliefs and practices that, you know, that you think that are, are, are that you object to or have questions about, right? So kind of creating that, that separation, which I think, again, is kind of going back to this idea of conflation, where you might hear that, you know, XYZ, concert, you know, prominent conservative Christian speaker um, holds the a particular set of views on sexual freedom or religious minorities and have this impression of the whole group. Um, and then in, in, in the process of which you also then conflating them with a different group, which is Christian nationalists, right? So there's, there's like multiple layers here. But tolerance says to not see them as a group but to see them for the specific beliefs and practices. And then from there kind of like figure out, you know, why um, these things are the things that you might be, even if you completely and very passionately disagree with, what might be some reasons for you to actually tolerate them or put up with them or create space and actually defend them, I would say would be the second step, right? Um, to actually defend a public space where these things are, are, are allowed to be expressed. Um, and in many ways, this sort of overlaps the idea of subordinate goals, um, because in the context of beliefs and practices, and again, it, it's not things that we can all agree are just kind of like outside the pale where, you know, where things that they're not things that sort of um, involve violence or, uh, you know, physical harm to people. Um, but things like, for example, the things that we are divided over, such as positions on same sex marriage uh, and, other, and, and abortion, for example. And, you know, what might be a reason for us to try to create a space where dissent is possible, dissent has its base, is because we believe in sort of these overarching principles of of pluralism, of free speech, and religious freedom. And subordinate goals is that same idea. Like how do you get these two groups that are sort of wired to be in conflict with each other because they're part, basically part of two different groups and that's what you do. You compete, you compete with the opposing group. Um, and that's a huge part of this, just sort of very human group identity dynamics that are at play here. Um, how do you get them to work together? How do you get them to actually stop seeing each other as the enemy? And it's when there's a goal that you can only really achieve if you do work together. And this was, again, a sort of a technical um, description, a term that I came to, to find to, to describe what I was already seeing in my engagements. You know, this whole thing started with my experience sort of being on my book tour and um, you know, being in spaces that were very, very conservative that I know for a fact would not necessarily have been open to my being there if it wasn't for the fact that I was talking about religious liberty and talking about religious liberty in a way that, that resonated with them as well. Um, that wasn't talking about religious liberty as some sort of special interest pleading where I'm here to talk to you about religious liberty for my group and while opposing it for your group. Um, and so I kind of parsed that in the book, like um, how can religious freedom be that subordinate goal that helps us to kind of come out of our respective tribes and actually work together. I see our, our Q&A box filling up with questions. Thanks for, for those. Um, I wanted to conclude my series of questions for you by asking um, about the context now of the Biden administration. The afterword of the book uh, touches briefly on, on the Biden era. Um, you note his, uh, his victory speech uh, in November, his inaugural address, some of the themes there. Um, you talk about uh, how there is uh, at least some indication of a, of a um, peeling away uh, of white evangelicals from Trump or, or Trumpism, but also some concerns such as the Equality Act that could re-intensify those feelings of, of vulnerability, which then would get played upon by certain political actors who want uh, to intensify those those feelings of vulnerability. Um, how do you see this playing out over the, the, the coming years of the Biden administration and, and what can the Biden administration do to, um, to bring the sort of unity uh, that uh, Biden has talked so much about? Sure, and yeah, it was a really interesting sort of process writing the book you know, during when we were still very much in the Trump era and all the sort of Muslim Christian dynamics that were created there and to be talking about that, but then 
you know, getting to a point where I was done with the manuscript and then Biden was elected and, and just a consistent theme of both his, his victory speech and then his inauguration speech was, um, you know, about unity and about sort of lowering the temperature. And that was the other part of it, right? And sort of this other major theme in, in the book was like, how do we um, lower the temperature, lower perception, perceptions of threat so that people's vulnerability is not politicized and, and weaponized. And so it was kind of interesting to kind of be writing about this at, at a time where we were, you know, tr literally transitioning from these modes of, of thinking. Um, and I think with respect to, to how Biden can approach this, I think it's, it's in many ways, it's the types of things that I present um, as strategies, as viable strategies in the book itself, right? So the things we were talking about just a little while ago in terms of zooming in and the superordinate goals and so on. Um, but the zooming in part of it specifically, because I think that the more that this conversation on religious freedom specifically can become about the, the finer details, the types of, you know, I mean, there's entire like anthologies oh, where, you know, where, where legal and other scholars are sort of thinking through in tremendous detail, like how to solve this issue of like religion and traditional religion and, and same-sex rights, right? Where people are just not, you know, they're kind of, out, they're not sort of like tied down to these, uh, these sound bites or these easy sort of sensational headlines to this easy characterization of the other group, but they're genuinely kind of coming together to find ways to make this work. And, I, and we've seen this in the policy space as well, for example, with respect to um, the Fairness for All legislation or the Utah Compromise, both which were sort of contributed to with the, in, and, and worked out in close relationship between gay rights groups and uh, conservative Christian groups who were kind of trying to figure out what's a way that we could do this and change the narrative away from, from hate to something that just understands each of us for what our needs are and finds a space for us to coexist. And so I think that those sorts of things, and I think it's a, it's a work in progress. I think there's things that even I'm continuing to sort of build on in terms of my research here. Um, but it's just like, if we can just, if, even if that shift can happen, it's not so much even that it's the resolutions will always be, you know, we're not gonna reach a perfect resolution where it's, it's always gonna be that compromise resolution. But I think if we can shift the way that we are approaching this, um, then that I think that the compromise will be possible in some areas. And even in areas where it's not possible, I think just the way that that's talked about in sort of non, um, in ways that sort of acknowledge the humanity of the people who are opposing it, as opposed to sort of, um, you know, political speeches about how the other side is inherently kind of coming at this from a place of hate, um, then I think that's gonna be like the biggest sort of shift. And, and, I, and I realize how complicated it is, but in a frame that is focused on lowering the temperature, I think uh, there really is no other way to lower the temperature um, than to actually acknowledge the other side as people who have legitimate grievances. Thanks, Asma. Let's go now to our uh, audience Q&A. We have several here now. And, and again, if you'd like to ask a question, just type it in that uh, Q&A box. Um, first question from uh, Faoud Shabad, and he, he said, uh, thank you for the informative introduction. In, in the category of evangelical Christians in Islam, where do you place groups like, or individuals like Franklin Graham, uh, Robertson, I assume Pat Robertson, John Hagee, the leaders of Liberty University and, and others. Um, and maybe just to, to riff on that a bit, um, when uh, Franklin Graham says something quite derogatory uh, about Islam or, or Robert Jeffress or someone else um, says something quite derogatory, um, I find that I wanna say, oh, they don't speak for all of us, but clearly they do speak for a lot of us and they have enormous influence. Um, uh, curious to get your thoughts on, on what to make of these sort of, uh, of these leaders who say unhelpful things and maybe where you might place them in your spectrum of, of Christian nationalism that you had in one of the early chapters of the book. Yeah, I mean, you raise a couple of important points, both Fouad and, and Judd. Um, you know, on the one hand, you know, I did say that I don't like how communities are treated as monoliths, but I also think that even that comparison in some ways has to be further complicated, and, and I fully recognize that. Because unlike you know violent extremists, that's not something that is you know being talked about and promoted at like Islamic universities or universities in the Muslim majority state or something that's in any way sort of mainstreamed in that way. As opposed to when I say that I want to talk to Christians and say and I don't want to treat you all as a monolith, there is a sort of tricky problem of some of these very problematic things being amplified at entire universities and entire television networks, right? Um, and so in the context of the book, like I actually, you know, the person I, I kind of identify as like the representative of Christian nationalism is, is Robert Jeffress. So somebody that you just 
um, that you just mentioned. And I think that you can make some analogies. I mean, I do mention Franklin Graham uh, and Robertson at, at various points in the book. Um, but, you know, as this person that, I mean, I think it's important to understand the distinctions between Christian nationalism and uh, conservative white evangelicalism. And again, I, I use those two because those are the two that are often conflated with each other. And certainly with all the extensive analyses of white evangelical support for Trump, I mean, there was so much attention on this particular group. And a couple of different things. I mean, in the book, I do get into this in way more detail, um, but two main points in terms of the distinctions between these two groups is what are, they, what are the goals? Um, and also what is the role of religion? And so, you know, for, for, and also in terms of posture, offensive versus defensive posture, which sort of comes out from their goals. And so Christian nationalists, their goals are first and foremost political. And, and whereas religious goals are not only just secondary, but in some cases kind of irrelevant in and of themselves uh, to the point where you, you saw Robert Jeffress saying that um, he, he actually sort of celebrating the fact that Donald Trump did not reflect sort of Christ-like character, characteristics. Um, it was just like, well, what we, what, what we need to achieve the political goals is all that matters as opposed to doing it in a way that sort of realizes and reflects our religious ideals. And so two different groups for one, politics and political goals are primary and for the other group, religion and religious goals are, are primary. And again, not establishing the US as a Christian nation in a way that excludes other people. Again, that would be a political goal, whereas a religious goal would be something about what your values are and how you wanna be able to live them out in, in public society. Um, which then also goes to this question of like posture that I, that, I, that I identify, that Christian nationalists take an offensive posture. It's about kind of obliterating the forces and the people and the groups and the ideas that in any way threaten their idea of what America should be. Whereas conservative white evangelicals take a defensive posture and sort of bring, for example, the religious liberty claims that they do because they're trying to carve out a space for themselves in, in a country that they think um, doesn't fully understand them. Um, and they're just trying to sort of be, they just want to do what they want to do as opposed to trying to you know, make that the norm for everyone else. Um, and so those are the ways I distinguish those, those two sets of people. And then I think based on that, I think you can probably group uh, Graham Robertson and others um, pretty easily. Thanks. A, a question from uh, Andrew Congdon, who's a, a graduate student at uh, Georgetown. And this gets to something you raised in the book around um, the difficulty of breaking out of our tribes and being labeled as black sheep and so on. Uh, he asks uh, for progressive Christians seeking to engage fellow Christians and evangelicals around understanding and countering uh, Islamophobia. What recommendations would you have for those of us who oftentimes find our efforts rebuked or labeled as apologetic or misguided? Well, I mean, there's there's a number of groups that have um, that are sort of working on precisely that question, right? And for example, there's a group called Neighborly Faith that I have done a number of events with, and they're very much focused on on sort of this message of like nothing about this 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 dialogue or this process is about in any way letting go of who you are authentically, right? Like, this is not about you watering down your beliefs. This, you can say fully or authentic um, to your, your identity as an evangelical Christian, to your idea of what is truth, what is divine truth. Um, and none of that is sort of impeded when you engage in this, in this conversation. And I think sort of emphasizing that over and over again, I mean, that's sort of being at the central frame that this is about your being able to be fully authentic to yourself, including fully authentic to all your disagreements that you have about um, about Muslims and Islam, you can hold true to that, even as you, you sort of get past the piece of this that, that, um, that's sort of more rooted, not so much in your identity, but in this idea of, of fear and, and even hate. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's the really sort of critical piece about, for me, about centering the conversation around something like religious freedom, um, because religious freedom, unlike other modes of conversation, specifically says that this is not about you know, resolving our um, theological differences. It's actually about saying that we can be authentic and honest to our uh, theological differences, but also still find a way to support each other and work together. Um, so I would say that, you know, using some of those modes. Um, and I think the other part of it that I actually talk about, I have a chapter in the book called um, Conspiracies, Conspiracies and Demagoguery. And it's really about this phenomenon that I saw and that then if you start reading books on like polarization, it's, it, you know, they actually say that um, if you don't take 
feelings of persecution seriously. We don't, even if, you, you know, the, to the extent that they're actually felt and understood as something very real, when you don't acknowledge that and you, and you minimize it, you create a space where demagogues and reactionaries can take it and seize it, right? And then and manipulate it. And I've seen this happen in the Muslim Christian context where you have this entire, you know, phenomenon that the Center for American Progress calls Fear Inc., where you have these extremely well-funded individuals and organizations that are dedicated to disseminating uh, fear and hate of Muslims. And they do this, they, they sort of seize on this like phenomenon of you're vulnerable, like the left is coming after you to uh, obliterate the space of Christianity in this country. And the way that the, that the left is gonna do this is, you know, one of the ways it does this is by partnering with Muslims and by you know, prioritizing Islam and Muslims over your faith. And they really kind of run with this idea um, where, you know, the, the very term Islamophobia or the very idea of seeing Muslims as people who are also suffering is part and parcel of your kind of giving into this project that's going to ultimately obliterate the space of Christianity in this country. Um, and this is, again, sort of a way of emphasizing the need to depoliticize vulnerability because it creates a space for exactly this sort of narrative that unfortunately is, is very effective. Um, I mean, you see politicians and news anchors repeating these talking points uh, over and over again to the point, you, know, you have Janine Pirro and her, on her show on Fox News saying that interfaith dialogue is the way for Muslims to, uh, what did she say? It was like to, to essentially to take over the United States and, and interfaith dialogue is the medium through which they're gonna do that. And you create the space where these things do become believable in some ways uh, because these people are sort of, you know, being in the space where they have, they have this vulnerability that's not being acknowledged except for the people, except for by the people uh, who are seizing on it and weaponizing it. And you, you mentioned in the book that interfaith is another one of those terms that one has to be a bit careful with, I guess, uh, at least when, when speaking with evangelical audiences, given that it can be perceived as a, as a Trojan horse or, or as um, a vehicle for watering down one's uh, convictions. I found that discussion in the book quite interesting. Um, a couple of good questions here from uh, Steve Lipson that um, I guess sort of touch on the superordinate goals uh, theme in, in, the, in the book. I'll, I'll pose both of these to you. Uh, he asks, uh, is there a risk that conservative evangelicals and Muslims coming together could align on one side of the culture war, uh, opposed to LGBT rights, for example? Or is there a way that promoting Muslim evangelical relations could tamp down the culture war and improve relations with the left and the LGBT community as well? And then his uh, second question uh, is, how would you recommend handling discussions between evangelicals and Muslims over the issue of Israel, where many evangelicals and Muslims have very different views? Your thoughts on those questions? Sure. So on the LGBT question, um, and I think that that is, I think maybe the initial reaction maybe to when people hear about coalition building oh, with conservative Christians, it's like, well, the coalition building is only going to end up serving a particular political goal. And I think that's the, you know, there's a point of this where it's like, we have to think about this in terms of the utilitarian impact, right? And, and appealing to people's self-interest, but also making sure that this isn't all about self-interest, right? This isn't just about, once again, achieving that goal that you're trying to achieve. And then you're sort of essentially tokenizing and using the groups that you can use to achieve that goal. And I think that that's a really important sort of part of this. Um, that has to be some, rooted in something more sort of deeply moral, this idea of what is right and good. Um, and then this, this, you know, so, so yes, there is this, this possibility, this danger. And I, I don't think that that's something necessarily that um, my framework is leading toward. I think to the extent that that's possible and happening, that's going to happen, you know, regardless of what, um, you know, sort of the framework of, of engagement that I'm presenting in the book, which is really about kind of focusing on people as people and focusing on vulnerabilities. And, and I talk about this LGBT question because in writing the book, you know, I realized that for, for Christians, it wasn't that they were primarily concerned with Muslims as a, the, the big threat in American society. The concern, the primary concern for conservative Christians is what's going on with respect to sexual freedom and sexual minorities. And so in writing the book, it was really kind of like, how do I talk about that? which is ultimately the central issue, but how do I explain that as ultimately creating a dynamic where American Muslims are collateral damage? And so there is a significant portion of the book where I kind of get into the question of LGBT rights and then, then, then kind of extend the conversation out to how, how if we can change this conversation with on, on questions of LGBT rights and religious freedom, 
um, or conservative religious descent, um, how that will then have an impact on the Muslim question. Um, and so in terms of could tamp down the culture war, this idea, the, the framework that I'm presenting in terms of um, acknowledging vulnerability as a way of lowering the temperature and recognizing shared vulnerabilities across groups instead of, instead of competing <laughs> to be the bigger victim um, is one that is actually being used in the context of um, you know, Christian LGBT peacemaking. Um, and so it's, it's useful in that way. So it can absolutely help tamp down the culture war Another way more broadly is that we can just get past this dichotomy of powerful majority versus marginalized minority. Um, I say early on in the book that the goal here is to talk about polarization without papering over marginalization and to talk about marginalization without exacerbating polarization. And those two things often just, I mean, that's a dynamic that just doesn't exist. It's, it's an either or type thing, right? We gotta, we gotta advocate for one. And if we start talking about the, the problems of polarization, that's almost like seen as selling out the question of defending marginalized minorities. But I was like, is there a way, and can I do it in this book, where we can actually talk about both and not be counterproductive? Um, and that's the, the aim here. And again, absolutely with the goal of tamping down the culture war. And in terms of improving relations with the left and the LGBT community as well, that, that is also a piece of it in, you know, a number of legal scholars and other commentators have pointed out that the more you can see, for example, conservative evangelicals as people, like that also then translates over to how they will then be able to see the people you're defending as people. And, you know, I say this in the context of Muslims, like if you're really concerned about protecting Muslims and from, from these attacks, the way to do it is not to keep making these people feel like they, you know, put them in a sort of in a state of being where they feel like they have to attack. And I'm not putting all the blame on the left. I'm just saying that this is a piece, one piece of it. Um, but if you really want to protect this marginalized group, then you need to, to sort of take a different tact here to be more effective um, in, in, in sort of protecting them. I want to have a question of Israel. I mean, this isn't something that, um, that I think I can answer, um, you know, in, in a helpful way um, and not something that I'm like, usually engaged in. I say pretty sort of laser focus on, on domestic issues and on religious liberty and all the related issues with, with religious liberty right now. So that's sort of the focus of my work. All right, we're, we're coming to the uh, end of our time now. Let me ask uh, one, one final question for you and then we'll uh, wrap up. This question from Philip Fernandez. He asks, uh, what role do migrant Christians from Islamic countries play in the understanding of Islam in North America? Well, I think, um, I mean, there's two pieces of this, right? So to the extent that Christians and the many Christians that I've met that who live in Muslim majority states and um, have an understanding of, of Muslims and Islam that's very different from the way that it's presented in the US. In the US with Muslims being 1% of the, of the American population, it's pretty easy to, for external actors to create a very sort of skewed perception of who Muslims are. Um, and to kind of create this image of Muslims as a monolith, as all one and the same. Whereas if you live in a Muslim majority state, you kind of see the diversity of, um, of Muslims, Muslim practices, Muslim beliefs, and have much, much closer relationships than in a context in which they're just 1% of the population. And so I think to the extent you're kind of coming at this from that perspective of you know, people who have that understanding, um, who probably in their own way have you know, thought through coalition building and working together with their Muslim neighbors in those contexts, bringing those experiences here to help uh, to help nuance that idea, that sort of antagonistic perception of Muslims to say that, look, it's actually not, there's nothing inherent about Muslims that makes them so different, you know, that makes them your natural enemy, right, to evangelicals. Um, you know, I think, there, let me tell you about these other experiences. I think I think that's the primary role, just to, to help diversify that that perception. Great. Well, thank you so much, Asma, for joining me in, in conversation today. This has been enormously interesting and helpful. Uh, thanks to our audience for um, logging in, for zooming in in their own way uh, today, and learning more. And again, I encourage all of you, if you're interested in learning more, to get a copy of of the book, which I uh, just thought was. Uh, Fantastic. Um, I want to thank my colleagues at the Berkeley Center for uh, putting this on and for our, our colleagues at the um, Awid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding for partnering with us. Uh, but Asma, thanks once again for sharing your insights and your time with us today. Thank you so much for having me.